was tossed and you know on Sunday night we like to take it and end it high and take it up to the sky but the Lord kind of moved me in another direction I want to talk to you for about something I think is needful in our hour today and uh, here is uh, I want to talk to you about the power of an altar that's what I want to talk to you about tonight I, um, let me go to Genesis chapter 8 and verse 20 I think I got my notes to them Noah built an altar unto the Lord took of every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar and the Lord smelled a sweet savor and the Lord said in his heart I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth neither will I give I, neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done so in at that point God made a covenant with man with heaven and with earth because of an altar situation and so I want to preach to you about the power of an altar how many's gonna help me preach just for a little bit amen why don't you clap your hands amen you might be seated in Jesus name now the concept of altars began in scripture a long time ago the word altar is used here as a place of slaughter or sacrifice blood ran and shed and death took place it symbolizes an acknowledgement of how to approach God how to get to a place where you are accepted of God and how to appreciate all of these things sum up one word called worship now the altar and the sacrifice has its roots all the way back to a man that was named Abel. And Abel offered of the firstling of the flock unto the Lord. We have the basic concept of tithing there. And that you always give God the best that you have. You never put on the altar anything that's left over. You always bring your very best what you're going to give to the Lord. Somebody else shout amen. amen. Now the altar, uh, the word altar actually only appears here for the first time as Noah again sacrifice. Now I want you to notice he didn't sacrifice uh, unclean, he sacrificed clean. The unclean, he couldn't eat, he couldn't do anything with it. I would think I would have did that, but no, Noah says, I'm going to give God the very best that I have. And so on the other side of the flood, he built this altar. And there he sacrificed unto the Lord. I think altar building for us is something that, it takes a lot of work to build an altar. It's not really that um, quick to build. These altars were made of dirt and rocks. And they had to put a slab of stone and then they had to kill or sacrifice and cut it in pieces and they cut up wood and tie the pieces up and lay it on the altar and then burn it with fire. And these things were called a sacrifice unto the Lord. And though we do not build altars like that anymore, neither do we sacrifice animals anymore, yet we need to understand that God is still looking for an acceptable sacrifice. God is still looking for people who will put something on the altar. And not just something that they're trying to discard. Not something that's used. Not something that's used up. But God is looking for those that will put their very best on the altar for him. Altars are places of encounters. Everybody say encounter. An encounter is a place, an uh, encounter happens when you and God meet at a certain place. And so in that certain place, things begin to happen. We see this in the life of Jacob. Jacob is running and he goes to a place called Bethel. And there it, he goes to sleep in this place. He makes a little rock for his pillow and he wakes up. And he has a dream in the middle of the night and he saw heaven open up and angels ascending and descending on a ladder and God was at the top of the ladder. And Jacob awoke up from the sleep and said, oh my God, this is a dreadful place. 
This is the house of God. And watch what he said. And the gate of heaven or the opening of heaven or a window in the heaven or a doorway into the supernatural. And I did not know it. I come to tell you today, there's things that we do that we have no idea the the, the uh, ramifications of. Some of you in here today don't even know that you can build an altar and meet God right here. We're right in the house of God, in the gate of heaven. The word gate means portal. It means an opening into the heavens. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And when Jesus, when Nathaniel went to Jesus and he said, I, I seen you by the fig tree. And, and, and he said, oh, oh, you think that's something? He said, from now on, you're going to see heaven open up. And angels, watch now, ascending and descending on the Son of Man. In other words, Jesus was a portal into the supernatural. I come to tell you that God did not leave us out of the supernatural. Maybe you don't believe in the supernatural, but I believe in the supernatural. I believe in a God that can supernaturally heal you. I believe in a God that can supernaturally keep you. Not too many in the house today. But you've got to learn how to build an altar. Somebody say amen. I had a granddaughter, a grandson that was one and one quarter pound. He fit in the palm of my hand, literally fit into the palm of my hand. He was in a NICU unit. That's, that's a neonatal IC unit. And he, all of his vital signs were, were breaking up. They were not good at all. They thought he was about ready to die. So my wife said, you need to get in there and you need to pray for him right now. So they wasn't going to let me in, but I finagle and I put on all my medical credentials and start talking medical jargon and they open up the door. I went in and did a three minute surgical scrub. I got some Johnson and Johnson. I didn't have any oil. I don't need oil. I just need the name. Y'all not going to help me preach. Y'all show me this morning. You want to go preach myself. Right? You see, ain't no power in the oil. My power. I wish I had somebody help me preach up in here. I said, the power is in the name of Jesus. When you call on that name, heaven comes to attention. When you call on the name of Jesus, the devil needs not like typewriter keys. I wish somebody help me preach up in here. There's power. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, there's power. I put a little Johnson and Johnson lotion on my finger. And I stuck my finger in the intubate. Not supposed to do that either, but you know, desperate times calls for desperate matches. I wish somebody help me preach it here. I stuck my finger in there and I said, in the name of, I didn't pray a pretty prayer. It's not in the pretty prayer. It's in the power that's in that name. And you can whisper that name and heaven. I said, you can whisper that name. Heaven comes to attention. You can whisper that name and demons start to tremble. You can. There's power in that name. Wonder working power. I said, in the name of Jesus. The REN behind, she was charting. All the instruments started to go off and everything was beeping. The O2 sensor was beeping and the blood pressure sensor, everything was. So she looked up. She dropped a pin and she was coming out there at me. I had my finger, I was looking at her. She was coming and give me a serious beat down, you know. So I'm like, girl, you better slow your roll. <laughs> I'm from the project. You pull up on me, I'm going to have to hurt you, girl. And she wanted to know, what are you doing? I said, I'm praying. What are you doing? She said, you can't. She's about to tell me, you cannot have your finger in that incubator. My hand was already up in there. I wasn't taking it off until she came and got me. And as she got about close to me, it's about past her, she stopped. She looked at all the monitors and said, I don't know what you're really doing, but you need to keep on doing it. Because his oxygen level is up. His heart rate is normal. You're not hearing what I'm saying. It's time we begin to understand there's power in the name of Jesus. And you need to build an altar. You need to, we need to build altars. 
so we can access the power of the supernatural. These portals are all over. We can encounter God in all places. First encounter we know of is in the book of Genesis where the voice of the Lord is walking in the cool of the day. That's a portal. They met him there. Watch now. Adam and Eve met, there, met God there every day at the same time at the same place. It was a daily thing. Not once a week. They met him there. Everybody said daily. Daily. And the, 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 certain, the very first day they didn't meet them there, they met the devil. They were supposed to be at the place of the altar where God could breathe on them. It was called the place and times of breathing. Are y'all listening to me? They were supposed to be there and stand in the presence of the Lord. He would, he would breathe on them, but they're over talking. Oh, you're not hearing what I'm saying. We need to get to the altar, build that altar, establish a relationship with God, and God will breathe on you. And you, oh, come on now. Amen. And animate you and give you power and authority. I don't know about you. But I don't want to be apostolic in name only. I said, I don't want to be apostolic in the name only. And I refuse to live in the name of the apostolics before or behind me. Thank God for them. But I told God, if I'm going to evangelize, if I'm going to preach, I want my own miracles. I want my own stories. I want to tell people what you did for me. I Come on, somebody. I'm not willing to tell his story. I'm not willing to tell your story. I want to say, here's what God is able to do. <laughs> Genesis chapter 12, God calls Abraham out of his country. Told him, I will make of thee a great nation. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1, 2, 3. Verse 2 says, I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless you. Make your name great and thou shalt be a blessing. Hmm. He says, I'll bless you. I'll give you a great name and you shall be a blessing. I will bless them that bless you and curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. When I read that, I'm thinking like, wow. I'm not sure what drew God to Abraham. I'm not sure. Just like I'm not sure what drew God to me. But I am glad that whatever he saw, he took a chance on me. I wish somebody help me now. You're not here because you're cute. You're here because God said, wait a minute, I think if you'll let me, I can mold can mold you into something if you just stay on the potter's wheel I can mold you into a the Lord appeared unto Abraham Genesis chapter 12 verse 7 said to him thy seed will I get this land and they build there built he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him this was the altar of promise Everybody has an altar where there is a visitation and an encounter and a place of promise which God says, this is what I would love to do in your life. Second encounter that Abraham has is the altar of prayer. Here he is just east of Bethel, the house of God, the gate of heaven, the portal into the supernatural. Here, it's not just God talking to Abraham, but it's Abraham talking to God. Oftentimes, we say, man, God is not answering any of my prayers. I'm, I've, I haven't heard from God in a long time. It is simply because we don't have courtesy. You see, God is a gentleman. And he can't talk if you run in your mouth. If you want to hear from him, 
Oh, I'm, I'm messing with somebody. Woo! It got real tight right there, boy. You don't get tight. I'll preach right on the tight until you loosen up. If God is ever nervous, it's in a Pentecostal prayer meeting. What's your name? Mark. How would you like to be God for a few seconds? He said, that'll be cool. All right. Now, all you're going to have to say is yes. Jesus. Okay, all you have, no, you stay with it. I don't need to follow him. You just say yes. Well, Jesus. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Jesus. 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 Oh, Lord. Hey, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Sound like anybody at a prayer meeting? <laughs> haven't said one word. Haven't made one request. Haven't put, no, oh, you're not helping me preach. Haven't put anything on altar. Calling his name for a full hour and never said one word and never gave him a chance to say anything. David said, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. In other words, I've got to talk and I've got to listen. I've got to listen for an answer from him. An altar is not a monologue. It is a dialogue. It's when he speaks to me and I speak to him. And he speaks to me and I speak to him. He speaks to me and I speak to him. So what are you saying, brother Pastor Emery? I'm saying I'll start off and then I'm quiet. What are you doing? I'm waiting. Wait, I say, on the Lord. I, I wish somebody helped me preach. <laughs> Wait, I say, on the Lord. I'm waiting. About two minutes, I'm waiting. I'm not screaming his name. I'm not hollering, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. That ain't tongues. That's you saying hallelujah like you got a machine gun. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on. Jesus, 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 Jesus. You sound like Mr. Brown on Tyler Perry. Sometimes you have to be quiet and let the Holy Ghost speak to you. God's got an answer. Do you have an, let him that hath an ear. Oh, okay, okay, all right. Maybe I'm off tonight, but I'm going to just keep on preaching. Let him that hath an ear, let him hear what the what? Spirit is saying. If we trust in the Lord with all of our heart. And not lean in on our own understanding. God will save me from a lot of trouble. The prophet said, I heard a word behind me that said, walk this way, not that way. Turn here, not there. And these are the places that we can do when we enter into an altar experience with God. At that altar, God gives you direction. He's there at Bethel. He pitches a tent in Genesis chapter 12, verse 8. And there he has Bethel on the west and Hanai on the east. He built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. This was an altar of prayer. He removed from the plains to a higher level, a higher place. An altar will cause your faith to rise. Because, see, when you first get up to pray, I don't know when you pray. I pray in the, at the times of breathing. The, well, it says, the voice of the Lord was walking in the cool of the day. Yes. Translation is, the times of breathing. Yes, so I was like, well, what time is that? It's about 4 a.m. in the morning. It is the most stillest hour that there is. It's cool and it's still. Nobody's running around. The highways are empty. It's a great time to travel. Amen. But it's a great time to get up. Because you're giving God the best part of your day. And I've had more encounters at about 4, 5 o'clock in the morning. But just me and God. Just talking to me. And it's not a long conversation. But enough to keep me out of trouble. 
Now, he's not going to give me a whole lot of instructions. <laughs> He'll give me what I need for that day. As thy day is, so shall thy strength be. You're not hearing what I'm saying. As thy day is, so shall thy strength be. In other words, he gives me enough strength for today. Yesterday is already gone. Tomorrow is not promised. All I need is strength for today. All I need is faith for today. All I need is blessings for today. All I need is direction for today. I wish somebody help me preach. We're worried about, you know what we worry about? Not today. We worry about tomorrow. No, don't worry about tomorrow. Just get through. Why? Because today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. I wish somebody help me preach up in here. What are you going to do tomorrow? I don't know. I might not even be here in the morrow. Abraham moves up to the mountain. He starts hearing the voice of God. He didn't stay in a level place. If we're not careful, we'll get stale and stagnant. We'll begin to operate in the mundane and status quo. That's a place of death right there. The, the psalmist said, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. In other words, I may go up just a little bit of an elevation, but there's higher places to go. Then I live a little bit higher in elevation, and then a little bit higher in elevation. And this is what John said in the book of Revelation. The angel of the voice said, John, come up a little higher. Come on, somebody. Just, just come up a little higher. I don't know about you, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not willing to stay at the same spiritual level. I want to go up. Oh, God have mercy. I must have the wrong son. I want to go up just a little higher. I want to get a little bit closer. Closer. I want to see God a little bit better. I want to serve him with a little bit more of my heart and a little bit more of my mind, a little bit more of, oh, come on somebody. I don't want to serve God like I did last year. I want to be better this year. I want to have more power this year. I want... Hear it. Abraham has two things going for him. He has a tent and he has an altar. Let me say that again. He has a tent and he has an altar. The tent is his home. Oh, do you know where I'm going now? This altar right here is not enough. Can, can I preach, Bishop? I said this altar here is not enough. No. You're only here once or twice a week, but you got a full time devil on your back. Somebody let me preach. I, I could have preached something to make you shout, but I didn't come to make you shout. I came here to get to the place where you can arise with power in your hand. Thank God for the altar here. But you're only here once, twice, or three times a week. What about the other seven days or six days or four days or five days when the devil's working on you 24-7? You need an altar in your tent. Let me break it down like a fraction with a decimal point. You need an altar in your home. I want to... Oh... The Supreme Court and the political realm have already, already took prayer out of the schools. And they took prayer all out of all public places. But I don't remember anything them taking prayer out of your house. It, it's it's going to get rough before it gets better. All right? Just... 
Rough, rough. Oh, okay, put your tray tables up. Put your seatbelt on. We're about to experience turbulence. Can I say the reason why America is in the place that it is? Is because the church quit praying. I know you don't, but I know you don't agree with me, but you have been wrong before. The Supreme Court didn't take church out your house. You just quit praying. You took the altar out your house and erected a television. You took the altar out of your house and erected all kind of mess that ain't getting you nowhere close to God. Whatever happened to the altar in your home where is you and your wife and your children? Come on, somebody's getting mad, but you're going to be glad in just a moment. I come to tell you it's time we build an altar in our living room. A place. Why? Because where the presence of the Lord is, there is liberty. Our children are not going to get God in public school. But that's why we have to build altars in our home. They're not going to get any Bible reading in the public school. And they don't get enough at church. You just can't drop your kid off at Sunday school and think they're going to raise them for you. No. You got to have an altar in your house. You got to have, you got to get God in your house. The reason our children and our families are falling apart because we have thrown God out out of our homes and if he's out of your home he's out of your heart too that's why our marriages are falling apart because God's not in the marriage he's the third covenant cord are you hearing what I'm saying he's the third covenant cord a three prong cord is not so soon broken he's part of your covenant your marriage is not an agreement. It's a covenant between you, that little lady, and God. And God cares more about your marriage than some of you do. You can't kick her to the curve because you don't like her anymore. Where are you coming from? And you can't kick him out because he done got fat and bald. Thank God for that. There's something else in my marriage that keeps it together. That's the altar experience. When I'm having trouble with my wife, I go tell her daddy. Oh, not her natural daddy. Oh, you ain't getting me. I said, God, you, got, you better come down and handle your daughter now. You better, you better handle that girl. Listen here, if you got, a husband, you got trouble with your husband, go tell his daddy. Daddy can do what you can't do. Daddy will come down and wake him up in the middle. You better leave my daughter alone, boy. I'll, don't make me come down there. When you get to having trouble in your house, uh, grab your wife, grab your husband, get in the living room, fall down on your knees, say, Jesus, uh, I refuse to let the devil come in my house. I refuse to let the devil mess up my marriage. I refuse to let the devil... Come on, I was somebody help me preach up here. You need to get your kids around you. You need to lay hands on your children. You need to prophesy to them. You need to impress them. You will live for God. The devil can't stop it. I come to raise some parents up. And some people get back to the old-fashioned religion. Bishop, what's happening is... We have left the plan. When they entered the east gate, mom, first thing they encountered was an altar. That's the tabernacle. Judah was at the east gate. Judah means praise. That opened the door and the first thing they encountered was a place to die. The reason why we're having so much trouble, we have not created a place for your flesh to die. Oh, okay, it's going to be nasty. 
I'm just going to preach on it now. Your flesh has got to have a place to die. Because if your flesh is in control, God is not in control. And you're going to have to bring your flesh down and submit your flesh. And sum I would somebody help me preach it here. Because when you surrender your flesh, the opening of the Holy Ghost, the, the parameters, amen, of God come down in your house. And God can stop trouble before it even starts happening. Now we go to Disneyland. No altars. We want God to be comfortable. And he's not. We like God, but he's too intrusive. He get all up in your business. God will get all up in your Kool-Aid and tell you what flavor it is. So you know what we want? We want a weekend lover. Yeah, we want, we want, we want Jesus to be a little something, something on the side. You know what I'm saying? I check you on the weekend, baby. You know, you know I love you. I hear that all the time. I love the Lord. Where you been? You ain't been to church in a while. Oh, you don't have to go to church. You can just have Jesus in your heart. Oh, okay. Now, what book, verse, and scripture is that? Because I've read the Bible over eight or nine times. I ain't found it. Well, I have to go to church. I'll just watch it online. Oh, are you sick? Paralyzed? No, it's just too much trouble for me to get up and get dressed and go to church. That ain't too much trouble for me to go to the movie and see the Black Panther. On Sunday night when I should be in church, I heard it was good. I don't care what color he is, I ain't going to see him. I got better, tr I got better stuff to do with my time to pay for this food to be rich. If I'm going to spend $100, I'm going to drop it in the offering plate. I'm going to mess with you. I come to make you uncomfortable. I want to ask you something. Do you have an altar in your home? It's getting really thick and quiet up in here. My altar is my retreat room. I'm in there at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. Jesus, you got to H-E-L-P me. That's help for some of y'all that's been, yeah, some of y'all that's been educated here in Mississippi. That's help. Huh? Hey, welcome to the city. Well, I got Mississippi. I got it down, girl. I'm from Alabama. Me, me and Forrest Gump, we're from Alabama. <laughs> That altar in your home can save you a lot of trouble. That altar in your home can help you manage your children. That altar in your home will bring blessings in your marriage. That altar in your home will keep the money flowing in your house. I wish somebody help me preach. If y'all don't want me to get on money because y'all really don't want me to get on money, y'all going to hate me for get on money. But... Don't worry, I'm used to hate, I hate love. You know, I'm gone tomorrow. I always get a round trip ticket so y'all can't hold me to beat me down. But trust me, I know some crack kids. It don't take me long. See what I'm saying, man? I can just that boom shackle. I'm up for <laughs> I'm an old thug from old school thugs and stuff, you know. Where, where's your altar? Let me ask you, do you have one? When's the last time you, see, the problem in the days of Elijah is not that they didn't have an altar. It was torn down and unused. An unused altar is not an altar at all. The people were halt between two opinions because the altar was not in use. It wasn't that they left God. They wanted to serve Baal and God at the same time. Sort of like us, we want to we wanna be carnal in the world Monday through Friday and then we're going to get holy all weekend long. Oh, the devil is a liar. You are who you are. He said, what are you doing? I'm coming with a trumpet in my hand to say it's time to build a personal altar in your home. 
and visit that altar on a daily basis and let God operate on you. Operate on your heart. Operate on your soul. Operate on you so you can be exactly what he wants you to be. Jesus said, when you enter into a place, let your peace go. You don't have no peace if you don't have no altar. Our world is in turmoil. You know what they need? They need people with peace. If we see everything, oh, there's another bomb. Oh, my God. What's going to I'm going, okay. God is still in control. So when I'm in Walmart, I'm walking around the streets, like I let my, I step in and I leave, I release my peace. I, I don't want to be arrogant here, but when I step in the building, the atmosphere changes. I know y'all don't get that. The environment shifts as long as I'm in that building. When I walk in, people turn around and look at me. I look at them and go like, "Yeah, that's Jesus." <laughs> They feel something they haven't felt in a what long, y'all not hearing me what I'm saying. When you walk in the building, honey, you ought, you ought to have a presence with you that changes the atmosphere. You ought to have a presence that moves the environment and say, wait a minute, something from another world just entered into the, uh, are you hearing what I'm saying? You have that power, you have that authority, you have that ability, but you need to build the altar. How important is the altar? It's an altar in the tabernacle. It's an altar in the temple. But now, in our churches, they become synagogues. Because in the synagogue, there was no altar. Go back and read it. In the synagogue, there was no altar. First time Jesus, when Jesus came out of the wilderness, from all of the Old Testament to that particular point, you don't hear a whole lot about demonic activity. But as soon as Jesus came out of the wilderness and the power of the Spirit, devils start acting up all over the place. Yes, the first time he went to the, to the synagogue in Nazareth, there was a demon-possessed man in there. See, altarless churches and altarless homes and people without altars invite a presence, but it's not the one you really want. And you know what that devil said? Leave us alone. Are, are you hearing me now? That is the spirit of our age. Leave me alone. Don't preach to me. Don't tell me what I have to do. Lead. Uh, I come to tell somebody, if you got a pastor that's not afraid to preach the truth, you better be happy. If you got a pastor that preaches like he don't need your money, he don't need your acceptance, but he's going to preach the un unadulterated word of God. Uh, you better clap your hands. Uh, you better say, God, I'm so thankful that I'm in a church uh, that a man of God will preach so I can be saved. Don't preach me no pretty stories. Don't let me go to hell, pastor. Preach. Somebody ought to shout, preach to me. Preach to me until I shake in the pew. Preach to me until conviction is so heavy. I got to run to the altar and throw myself down. Preach to me. Don't let me go to hell. Don't let me be lost. Preach to me. Bishop, don't let me be lost. Preach to me. Snatch me by the nap of my neck and tell me, boy, you better turn around. You're doing something wrong. Preach to me. Grab me. Don't feel sorry for me. Don't care if I get offended at you. I'll get over the offense, but I won't get over hell. Preach to me. Preach to my children, because I don't want my children to preach. 
Is anybody going to help me? All of y'all need to be on your feet and preach to me, Pastor. Don't let me be lost. Preach to me. Get me to an altar. Get me to a place of sacrifice. Get me to a place where I can die. Preach to me till I change. Preach to me until I come off my cigarettes. Preach to me until I get away from my dope. Preach to me until I quit cheating on my wife. Preach to me until I quit lying. Preach to me until I quit stealing. I would say y'all is awful quiet. But preach to me, preacher. Don't let me sit here and go to hell. Don't let the devil have my children. Don't let the devil get my marriage. If you got a preacher like that, you ought to be clapping your hands. And you need to let him know every day. Preach to me, pastor. Preach to me. Preach to me. Where there is no altar, there is demonic activity. That's why we need altars in our home. Our children are vulnerable in this world. We, we got all kind of stuff going on. I'm in the airport. Some dude brings his little girl in the restroom in the airport. I'm like, what is wrong with you, bro? That's crazy. Little girls do not belong in a man's restroom. I don't care. Do y'all, I'm not getting any main men. I am, listen, I need to tell you something. If you're looking for me to be politically correct, you got the wrong preacher. I am not politically correct. I'm biblically correct. It was an abomination then, and it's a, okay. It's an abomination. It wasn't right then, it ain't right now. I don't care what they legislate. I don't care what the president say. I don't care what the Supreme Court said. It's not right. I will not. I will not allow my kids to be exposed. Because I think somebody's going to look at me like I'm crazy. I ain't crazy. I'm clothed and in my right mind. I said, I'm clothed and in my right mind. But churches are saying, leave me alone. Don't tell me how to dress, preacher. Don't tell me I got to give money. Don't tell me I got to do this. Don't tell. Just what? That happens when there's no altar. That happens when there's no altar. When there's no place for my flesh to die. My carnal man takes over and I want God just leave me alone until I need you. Yeah, we have convenience, but no convictions. Leave me alone until I get in trouble. But God is looking for full-time love affairs. 24-7. I, was some, I know this is old-fashioned preaching for some of y'all. 24-7, 365. Pam is here. That altarless synagogue. It was altarless, Pastor. There were withered people in there. There were people with issues of blood. There were people with the, 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 the cat in Capernaum. He had a withered hand. And when he walked in, they looked at him and said, I bet you he's going to try to heal him. Look at the attitude that they had about God and about healing. Because there was no altar. Jesus said, stretch forth your hand and boom, shakalaka. What did they do? They threw him out of the synagogue. They got so far removed away from God that they didn't even recognize a miracle when they saw it. This is in the days of Jesus. When he went to Nazareth, he got up to read. 
He took the scroll in the Bible. Watch this. I love it. It says, and when he had found the place. Do you know what that means? Do you know what that means? Jesus took the scroll. There was no, there was no verses and chapters. So he had a good understanding of scripture. So he didn't just go and go, Isaiah. He said, hmm, this is not it. Grab another scroll. That's not the one. Um, see, Isaiah, no, 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 okay, that's Isaiah 50. He kept until he found. How well do you know the Bible? Can you go to the Bible and find the place? Or do you go have to ask Google where it is? You don't ask Google, you ask Alexa, like she knows something about God. It's artificial intelligence. She's not a real person. Siri, she's on crack. Go ahead and try to tell her, let her tell you where to go. You'll wind up. You're trying to come over here to Madison, you'll be in Louisiana somewhere, down in New Orleans, eating crayfish or something. That chick ain't got no sense at all. A little bit too much silicone in that girl. She high. She has a Georgia pine. <laughs> that, girl, that, guy, that girl is crazy. Where is the assistant that was preaching for Joel Urshan? Trying to get to his church, never been there before. Siri leads me to the middle of the, right in the middle of the bridge and says, Arrived. I said, What in the name of God? Arrive where, lady? I'm in the middle of a bridge. What am I supposed to walk on water? What? You, what? You, Arrived. <laughs> Boom. That shit's a thing, man. You need to put the cell phone down. Open up your Bible for a while. You need to get off Facebook. Look him in the face for a while. See, it's getting awful tight now. Start messing with your stuff. I don't know what Snapchat is. Sounds like something you get at the corner store. I don't tweet because if you tweet, that means you are a twit. I'm not a twit, so I don't tweet. I don't know about all this stuff. All I know is that you won't find God in any of it. So at some point, we got to get back to the, give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough. Oh, it was good enough for my mother. It was good enough for my mother. It was good enough for my mother. It's good enough for me. The last altar that Abraham built was on top of a mountain called Moriah. And there he took his son, his only son, to offer him as a sacrifice unto the Lord. Isaac had a working understanding. He says, Father, I, I see the wood and I, I see all the, all the stuff. I see the wood. I see the rope. Uh, you got the knife. I'm worried about that. You're about 130 years old. And, you know, you have, you have Alzheimer's or, you know, you, you got dementia because you're not thinking right here, Dad. I'm, I'm cool. So I do not see the burnt offering. And Abraham said, don't worry about it. He said, no, Dad, I'm worried because yeah. yeah. you're tying me up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm good, Dad. I'm here, but, you know, I, this, I'm, it, there's supposed to be something else besides me to burn. Uh, oh, you see, I'm putting myself in the story. And if I'm Isaac, I'm going to go like, bro, Dad, what you doing, Dad? Dad? Dad, you, you got, Dad? You, you got the, Dad, you got the knife in your hand, man. What you doing? Don't act like you're just going to lay there to cut me. <laughs> Seriously. 
cut me, Dad. Just don't make it wide enough. I'm going to be like, Dad, what's up? The Lord will provide. Well, he better provide real quick. <laughs> Abraham is not the hero of this story. Isaac is the hero of this story. Because Isaac becomes what God really wants, which is a living oh. A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is my reasonable service. Withholding nothing back, okay? You know what God's looking for? He's not looking for a lamb or a ram or a dove or a pigeon or a bull or an ox. He's looking for you. He's looking for an acceptable sacrifice on the altar. I was preaching revival down in a place called Chula Vista, right outside of San Diego. A very nice place. Preaching at Brother Buxton's Chula Vista. In that, all, in, that, in that revival spirit of giving broke out. I mean, there's money all over the place. People giving money, 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 throwing money. There was this one little black girl there that, that was uh, part of the uh, job corps there in San Diego. She didn't have any money, so she was crying. And I see people around her praying with her. I thought, oh, wow, what's happening to her? And I found out what was happening was that she wanted to give, but she didn't have anything to give. Her heart was breaking because she didn't have any money, Sister Dylan. So you know what she did? She crawled up in, on the altar in the fetal position. And she says, God, I don't have any money, but I will give you all of me. Take everything of ours. I come tonight to see if there's some people like this little girl that says, God, I've been half-stepping, but I'm coming tonight to give you all of me, all of my heart, all of my soul. Watch this. All of my future, I'm giving it all. All of my plans, I'm changing tonight. I'm withholding nothing, withholding nothing, withholding nothing, withholding nothing. Lord, I give my all to me. Do I have any praise? Come on. Everything I give to you Withholding nothing Withholding nothing Withholding nothing Withholding nothing Say it one more time Withholding nothing Withholding nothing one more time with hold with holding nothing with holding nothing I give all I give Second, lift those hands and give it to him right now. Withholding nothing. I'm withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. Verse one. I surrender all to you. Come on, it's time to lay it all down right now. I'll put it on the altar, everything you've got. Holding nothing. Oh, oh. Holding nothing. Come on, give it all right now. He's not, he's not looking for your money. He's not looking for your job. He's looking for you. I give you all of me. 
because as soon as you surrender it all, the windows of heaven is going to open up. I give you all of me. I give you all. I give you all of me. I give you all. Come on, hands raised right now. I give you all of me. I give you all. I give you all of me. I give you all of me. King Jesus, oh, oh, oh. King Jesus, my Savior. young people to make their way up close as a matter of fact I want you to come up and just lay on the altar come on all the young people I want you to get up here fighting just lay right on the altar come on come on don't worry just on the steps you can come up here and just lay on the steps all the young people come on and I want all the parents behind your kids up here can we do that right now come on, if your kid is up here come on I want the parents to begin to lay, on, lay your hands on your children. I want you to start praying over them and say, you're going to live for God. I want you to prophesy to them right now. You are not meant for this world. You were meant to live for God. Come on, y'all. Come on, parents. Prophesy to your child. Tell him he's anointed. Tell him he's appointed. Tell him he's special. Come on. Tell him God's got his hand on your life. You can't live like everybody else is living. You can't do what everybody else is doing. Come on, parents, grandparents, mama, grandmama, granddaddy. Come on, somebody. The children of the next generation, we cannot let them be lost. You need to raise your voice. Cry aloud. Spare not. 